and welcome to space here from the Mullard Space Science Laboratory in southern England. We're here to meet scientists working on the Cassini-Huygens mission to Saturn. The mission, which has landed a probe on Titan, discovered an icy ocean on Enceladus and is right now flying between the rings of Saturn and the planet itself. So let's find out what's new. The Saturn specialists have a picturesque lab here in the Surrey Hills from which to study the solar system's most picturesque planet. Down on the croquet lawn, MSSL's Geraint Jones explains how the Cassini team is swinging the spacecraft into its final orbit to get the closest possible view of Saturn. The Cassini has been orbiting uh, the planet for many years and it's using Titan to change its orbit. And then at the end of April it changed the, the orbit again, passing close to Titan. And now the really exciting bits, we're passing between the atmosphere and the ring system of Saturn and doing this 22 times uh, until the end of September when the mission ends. By going inside the rings, um, we can measure the distribution of mass inside the planet and finally figure out how much material is in the ring system uh, orbiting around the planet itself. One of the major findings so far is that the 2,000 kilometre gap between the icy rings and Saturn's cloud tops is empty dust. Professor Michel Doherty has a magnetometer on Cassini and stresses there's so much more to learn about Saturn. We don't understand what its interior looks like. We think there's a solid core. There's probably a liquid region above that core which is somehow generating the magnetic field. The other thing is it's quite embarrassing to admit this, but we've been there for 13 years and we still don't know how long a day is on Saturn. Saturn is what's known as a gas giant, a planet made of 75% hydrogen with some beguiling features in its clouds that Cassini should help explain. One of the coolest images of Saturn is the, the view of the North Pole where you see that hexagonal structure rotating in the atmosphere. But by being able to remotely view the atmosphere and see how the structure changes over time, it allows you to understand the dynamics of the atmosphere. If material is coming up from below, uh, some of the instruments are able to tell you what kind of molecules and material are in the atmosphere. And so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of, it's almost like tasting the atmosphere without actually having to get into it. The mission has also found Saturn's moons to be just as diverse and intriguing as the planet. Back in 2005, Cassini dropped off ESA's Huygens probe onto Titan and discovered a dingy world where petrol-like rain falls from the sky. The temperature at the surface of Titan is about minus 180 degrees, so it's very cold. The landscapes of Titan look a lot like what we have on Earth. We have rivers, lakes, seas, almost oceans of methane. It rains, it rains methane or a mix of ethane and methane, so there are lots of meteorological phenomena or geophysical phenomena on Titan that make you think of what happens on Earth, but the ingredients are quite different. The other moon to fascinate scientists is Enceladus. Far smaller than Titan at just 500 kilometers across, it's active and dynamic, as Saturn specialist Sheila Kanani demonstrates. So we realized with the Cassini mission that Enceladus is covered in ice, and at the south pole um, there are cracks in the ice. From those cracks, there are jets of material coming out. And Cassini flew through the jets in 2008 and measured salty water, ammonia, silicates, hydrocarbons, all kinds of interesting possible markers for life. So we've got this fire extinguisher here today to show us what the plumes really look like. And you can see that they jet out, and they really do jet out. You can see how active Enceladus really is. And as the plume jets out, it covers Enceladus in fresh material, making it the brightest object in the solar system. And it also replenishes the E-ring, which is one of the wider rings of Saturn, which shows why Enceladus is so important for Saturn. Cassini's 13-year odyssey around the Saturn system comes to an end on the 15th of September this year. 
To avoid the spacecraft crashing into Titan or Enceladus, two pristine moons that could just be home to life, Cassini is being deliberately destroyed in the clouds of Saturn. Well, the end of the mission, it'll be very sad, uh, but we're going out uh, taking science data all the way down. The, uh, the orbit will get lower and lower, and we'll start skimming the top of the atmosphere, and there are a few instruments on Cassini that can sample the atmosphere directly, so we can measure uh, instantly what the atmosphere is made of. But in the very last pass through the atmosphere, it'll get so deep that uh, the spacecraft will start tumbling and will burn up and eventually will become part of Saturn itself. And that sadly will be the end of uh, the very successful Cassini mission. Cassini will keep an antenna pointed at Earth throughout its final dive, sending back data right up until the moment it breaks up, never to be heard from again. And now to the latest episode in our mini-series, Legends of Space, celebrating 60 years since Sputnik. This month, we've chosen to look back to May 1990, when the Hubble Space Telescope went into operation. We spoke to some of the scientists who've used this extraordinary instrument. We had this possibility to look at the stars, the universe, in a very precise way, really sharp images. And we were also able to look at wavelengths of light that are absorbed by the atmosphere of Earth, like ultraviolet and infrared. When the first observation became available, then it really changed everything. And I myself moved to observations because I thought it was even more exciting. Everyone was very excited with the idea of discovering things never seen before, and that's exactly what happened. Understanding cosmology, understanding uh, the nature of very far away galaxies. Uh, really, Hubble was uh, the first instrument able to uh, deliver uh, observations that were groundbreaking. And the fact that uh, Hubble is always there through the careers at this point of a number of generation of astrophysicists is, is really remarkable. Astrophysicists are getting old, but it looks like Hubble is still there. So. That's all we've got time for in this programme. Next month, I'll be with the leaders of the space industry at the Paris Air Show. And in the meantime, you can keep up to date with other news from the universe in our space blog on euronews.com.